I'm from Mayo Clinic. I'm a bioinformatician, so I do data analysis every day, um, mostly sequencing data. Um, so this is a very new project. So we haven't run anything on Blue Water. So hopefully I can give you some background information and convince you why we need Blue Water. Okay. So the goal is to really search for disease variants in the sequencing data. So So in the last 20 years, the sequencing, the cost of sequencing has gone down dramatically. So 1997, when the Human Genome Project finished, the mapping and the establish of a reference human genome, which is one genome, cost $3 billion, billion dollars in the 10 years. And today, you can sequence a person's genome in a lab in a day and cost only a thousand dollars and the cost is still going down so the turning point is of course the introduction of the um, next-gen massive parallel sequencing machine in 2005 um, because of that there's really tons of sequencing data now uh, in the public database um, this figure is old 2017 multi-million of human genome data available. And if you look at a uh, smaller scale, like exome sequencing, it's in the, uh, even more data. So why do we sequence so many of the human genomes or exomes? It's because we're looking for disease-related variants. So this is a figure to show the relationship between variants and disease. So in the last 20 years, we've done very well at the two end of the spectrum. So this end are common variants. Common variants means um, more than 5% of human beings have them. So these kind of variants are common. So they contribute to common disease, but individually they cannot be too damaging because if 5% of people have a very damaging um, mutation, then those 5% of people that have severe disease, which is not the case. So we're looking for complex, common disease such as diabetes, obesity, um, these kind of uh, common disease. So we've done very well without using sequencing, using something else called GWAS. So at the other end of the spectrum, really, uh, this is looking for rare variants with severe consequences, things like um, um, one single mutation will cause Huntington's disease, for example. So those really, the research of those really took off after the sequencing made available because you can get a family, um, both parents and the child who have the disease or sequence 20 of the relatives, you basically can find which gene or which mutation is responsible. So today what we're looking at is in the middle this one, low frequency variants uh, with intermediate effects. So they're usually uh, somewhere between 0.1%, 0.01% to 1%. So because of that, you really need to sequence a lot of individual to find these variants. So if the frequency in population is 0.1%, you sequence 1,000 individual, you found one with it. So that's where things get really messy. We don't really have a lot of um, uh, computational power or money to sequence that many people, but people are doing it nonetheless. Um, so before I got into why we need blue waters, I, um, this is really the simplified version of the data analysis steps, two major steps. First, after you sequence an individual, it gets hundreds of millions of reads. The first step is map it onto the reference genome. Um, because of the how you can afford to uh, do a true multiple sequence alignment, so what you do is pairwise. In each individual reads map to the reference. After that, because pairwise is not very uh, sophisticated, you do local block by block fine tuning. Uh, realignment local assembly a little bit to wiggle that bundle of reads locally into a better mapping. 
After that, you do something called variant calling. Basically, you trust the map now. You look at each location. You count how many A's and G's and C's uh, and T's. If the reference says it should be an A and you found plenty of G's, in this case, you found a variant from A to G. Sometime you found a gap in the individual's reads versus reference, there's a deletion here. So that's really the simplified version of variant calling. So look at a little more details of the algorithm used for read alignment. First of all, like I said, it, it's really CPU and the RAM intensive and slow because of all, oh, because of all these um, manipulation you do local block by block basically along the entire genome. Um, second, you have a lot of uh, liners algorithm available. They are all specifically designed for this um, next gen sequencing problem, which you have hundreds of millions of reads. You have to balance um, between speed and accuracy and think about how you deal with genomic complexity. Some regions are messy, it's just not straightforward mapping. So there's many parameters for aligners available. Um, for a naive user, they just use the default setting, which um, just give you a balance for the different types of variants discovery. For example, um, you can decide during the mapping you penalize heavily the gap. If that's the case, you're not likely to find a lot of in insertions and deletions. Um, so most of the people just use the default setting without asking what each of the parameter does. So therefore the current practice is you analyzing thousands of uh, individuals' genome, you pick one of the top aligners everyone likes and uh, use the default parameter. So here's the rationale why it's actually okay. People convince themselves using one aligner is fine because these early studies of benchmarking of the performance of different read aligners. So there are probably uh, 10 aligners here. So inside the premise, uh, parentheses are the time required to align 2 million reads. So um, the slowest is novel line and the fastest is probably subread. So if you allow the error rate, the x-axis is the error rate you allow. So if you allow one bad wrong mapping among 1,000 reads, that's 0.1% of the error rate, every aligner pretty much, pretty much converge to the same kind of performance. Uh, obviously, there are two better um, aligners, Novoline and uh, BWMM. Uh, Novoline is the best, but it's very slow, so not a lot of people use them. Um, so one thing worth pointing out is this is okay because 0.1% of error, imagine you have 1,000 reads stacking up here. Variant calling is really a consensus voting process, so that one mistake doesn't really affect your calling. So it's okay to allow a little bit of uh, error. That's why um, for a long time people think the selection of a liner doesn't matter that much and the parameters doesn't matter that much. So, however, all these publications justifying just picking one aligner based on one set of data. I use this two million reads of simulated data. Other people use one real uh, data set from one individual. The conclusions are more or less the same, so aligner doesn't matter. So what happens if you're looking at a thousand individual, ten thousand individual, or one million. So that little bit of error does it really matter? The so I try to convince you, yes, it really does. So here I really uh, leap forward to the consequence of the alignment accuracy, which is the variant calling. So there's a gap in between. So uh, because of time constraint, I'm not going to fill that gap. But basically, size matters during the alignment and size matters during the variant calling. So this is the, what people do to switch from one aligner to another. They look at one individual, look 
they look at the number of variants called, they look at commonly called versus unique variants. They say, ah, the difference is only 1%. It's no big deal, move on. So that's how they justify from Novo line to BWA MAM because much faster BWA MAM. That's the bottleneck of a whole pipeline is the read alignment. So, but if you look at increasingly large sample sizes here, we have almost 2,000 samples from 50 to 2,000. So let's call this unique variance, which is identified by using one aligner but not the other, and the common variance. So you look at the percentage of common variance identified by two of the top aligners, the common is now decreased to 75%. So 25% of variants have not become unique. So the question is, this is a huge number you cannot really ignore now. So the question is, what are these 25% of unique variants? Are they good variants? Are they really weird when hit among 2,000 individuals? Do they happen um, in multiple individuals? Are they known variants versus totally novel? So these are the questions we asked. So our starting data is really the 10,000 individuals sequenced by the Alzheimer's disease uh, sequencing project. Um, we didn't have blue water, so the best we could do is look at 2,000 samples. We identified total about 20 million variants. The percentage of unique variants, if you look at 2,000 individuals, is about 25%. So this 25% is our, uh, the list of variants of interest. So first thing we look at is because um, complexity of genomic regions are different from chromosome to chromosome, are these common or unique variants located at different regions? Um, if you look at BWA versus Novoline unique variants and the common variants, look at the percentage of the variants located in each of the chromosome. So each of the rainbow color is one chromosome of the 23, they look very similar. So there is no bias as to whether these unique variants are located in a very bad region and not reliable. So that's comforting. And the next one is look at the complex regions, like short repeats. Those are very complex regions, not easy for mapping. You look at the BWA versus novel unique variants versus common. They are more or less similar because even the bar shows you different, but look at the number. They're well below 0.1%. And the Novo line has more unique variants in the, in the complex region because Novo line are designed to uh, deal with this complex region. So that's the benefit of local uh, no, Novo line. So the next thing we look at is, um, are these unique variants known or they are totally novel? So just look at the numbers. These are the percentage. They look all the same, right? So uh, whether it's unique or common variants, about three quarters of them are known variants and uh, one quarter are unknown. So this last number is called CAT score. This is a calculation of how likely to be functional. Um, based on conservation um, across different species. So the percentage of the novel variants that are predicted to be functionally important are also very similar across these three categories. So that's another indication that that's just not to ignore these unique variants. So the next thing we look at is functional category. We can categorize variants into three tiers. The first would be um, the protein truncating. The second tier is amino acid substitution and a protein translation codon frame shift. The third is other variants, uh, not with too many known functions. So look at tier one, tier two, and tier three. Again, the breakdown are similar among the three categories. So, but we did find something that's different about these um, unique variants. So. First, something similar again, the clonality. So not so much in the blood DNA, but in a tumor. If tumor has multiple clones, a small clone, the mutation you find supporting reads will only be a very small fraction of total reads, right? That's called clonality. 
So here, most of variants we found, whether it's common or unique, they are all around 50%, which is expected because everyone is uh, deployed uh, one copy from mom, one copy from dad. So if mom's has a change, that position should have 50% of the concentration from the reads. So no difference in clonality. No difference in sequencing quality. These are the sequencing scores. So all three type of variants are good quality. They are 60 and above. And another one, local um, GC content. GC content, uh, AGTC, four nucleotides of a human DNA. If you have more GC, um, the bound between the two strands of DNA are tighter. So that causes different dynamics during sequencing. So high or low GC content sometimes means uh, unreliable sequencing uh, results. And look at these um, unique versus common, they're similar again. But here, that's the only difference we found about these unique variants are in this figure. So again, the blue, uh, the green one, sorry about, it's not easy to see, the green one has a bump. So all the common variants have a lot of, oh, okay, now I'm using common twice. Common variants found by two aligners are common variants among population. There are more than 10, 20, 30 percent of human population have them. But unique variants found e by only one aligner have a much smaller population. And this look at the population is about one to two percent in population. This is actually the type of variants we're interested in. Remember that figure, we're looking for rare variants. So that's the variants you're missing. So to summarize this, uh, we, we, we saw the multiple aligners um, up front rescued a significant percentage of good variants, one sample size increases, and uh, we also tested other uh, steps of the variant discovery um, workflow I'm not, I did not talk about here, but observations are very similar. So basically, uh, you need to use a comprehensive approach, multiple liners, multiple parameter settings, and different strategies for genotype calling. They all gonna help you find that missing variants, and those are the variants of your interest. So here's what we propose to do on Blue Water. We just got a project approved. We're gonna look at the entire 10,000 individuals from the Alzheimer's disease project. We're gonna look at more aligners and the different parameter settings within each aligner. And we're gonna try to estimate the cost of the computing, uh, whether it's too expensive, what is um, practical, and um, my co-PI is really uh, Luda from UIUC. So here are the people who worked on this project. Um, Ying Xie, uh, Vivek, and the Shulan are from my, uh, my lab. And uh, the ADS PPIs, they provided data for us to look at. And UIUC collaborators, Luda, Dr. Hudson, and Jacob, uh, Jacob is one really starting to put data onto Blue Water. So hopefully next time, if I'm invited back, I can tell you our findings. Thank you.